OK, so it's recording now. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to lecture 14 of the course Quantum Theory in a Nutshell. And today, I want to continue the discussion that we started yesterday, which was about um, the fact that um, when you are uh, making a measurement in a quantum system, and the quantum state is not an eigenstate of the observable that you're measuring, um, the outcomes that we're going to get will be different uh, for every time that you make a measurement. So, of course, at some point the numbers can repeat because you have just a finite set of, of, of possibilities sometimes, and you're going to get the same numbers with some probability. So, um, and then we have seen that if a system is in an eigenstate, of an observable, and you measure this observable, then you get always the same value. And um, we have seen that because of this fact, if you want to um, um, compute the expectation value of this observable in this particular state, then uh, you will find that um, the expectation value coincides with the outcome of the experiment. And I remind you that this is not the case always, right? I mean, um, if you compute the expectation value of an observable in a generic state, the value that you get out of this computation typically will not agree with one of the values that you, uh, ha that you have as an outcome of a measurement. Um, so um, we then defined uh, the following concept. When you make a measurement, and you get outcomes that are different from the expectation value of, um, of an observable, then you can quantify how much the outcomes will differ from the expectation value. And we introduced this concept of fluctuation. So this is a quantum fluctuation. It's a fluctuation of the value uh, of the measurement with respect to the value that you get as for the expectation value of the observable. And in order to quantify those fluctuations, we have introduced this concept of mean square deviation. And what we worked out yesterday, I will not go over again, it is recorded so you can check, is that if you define the mean square deviation using this expression here, you can uh, just by doing algebraic manipulations, show that the, uh, uh, this deviation, delta A, can be written as uh, this is square root of the expectation value of the observable squared and the square of the expectation value. And typically, these quantities will not agree. So you're going to get a non-zero value here, OK? OK. Um, we also discussed yesterday that observables are represented as Hermitian operators. And if they are Hermitian operators, uh, we saw that the, the operator A will be equal to its Hermitian conjugate. So it will be equal to a dagger. So observables, they must satisfy this property. And we also saw that if, uh, um, um, if you act with uh, a Hermitian operators on eigenstates or eigenvectors of these operators, the outcome is always a real eigenvalue, OK? So Hermitian operators, they have a real spectrum, as we, as we defined yesterday. The spectrum is nothing but the set of the eigenvalues of the operator, OK? So uh, in, in the following, in these notes, I derive uh, 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 an inequality, OK? And in order to derive this inequality, I'm, I'm not going over the algebraic details because I wrote everything in details here so that you can 
follow step by step. Um, but the essential uh, 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 part of this um, derivation is the following. Um, so suppose that I have a, a remission operator and then uh, two remission operators and A and B, and then I just construct the following um, the following operator. I take A, sum with I, which is the imaginary uh, unit, and then I multiply by a real number, so lambda is just a real number, and then I multiply this number with the operator B. So I'm defining a new operator, which is just A plus I lambda B. And I act with this new operator on the state U, which is not necessarily um, um, an eigenstate of A and B. So it's just a state. And the statement that I'm writing here is that if I this new vector, which I will obtain from the action of this new operator on the state U, will have a norm squared, which is bigger or equal to zero, okay? So this is just a mathematical statement. I'm saying if I have a vector and I act on this vector with an operator, I will have another vector. And this new vector must have um, um, uh, a norm that is bigger or equal to zero, right? Uh, there is a question in the chat. Uh, where is this uh, inequality comes from? Well, I'm just saying here that the norm of, of a vector is always a non-negative number. Okay? So it, the, the norm essentially computes the magnitude or the size of the vector. And I'm saying that this size is greater or equal than zero. It cannot be negative. All right? Okay. Um, but then I can just write this in an explicit form. And this implies that, well, I'm just taking the scalar product of this product of operators, sandwiched by the state U. Okay? So if I write the corresponding bra associated with this new vector here, remember, if I have an operator acting on a cat, then the corresponding bra will be the bra of this vector, so bra u, and then the dagger of this operator. But the dagger of this operator is just a dagger, which by definition is just a. Then I have to take the dagger of this entire part here. So when I take the complex conjugate um, of I lambda, I get minus I because of the complex conjugate, lambda star, but since lambda, lambda is a real number, then lambda star is just equal to lambda. And then B dagger, but B dagger is just B by, by assumption. So when I, when I um, construct the bra associated to the new vector here, I obtain this bra here. And this is multiplied by the corresponding cat. So I'm just making algebraic manipulations with cats and bras, okay? So this inequality must hold. And then I can take the product of these two guys. So A times A, and then I have A times I lambda B, then I have minus i lambda b times a, and finally minus i lambda b times i lambda b. And this is written here, but you have to be careful because as I said, in general, operators will not commute. So I cannot just place b and a at any order. I have to obey the order that they appear. So a times A will be A squared. A times B, I lambda is just a number, so I can pull out. So 
a times b will be just a times b okay i'm not i cannot exchange the order but then i'll have minus i lambda b times a and this is written here minus b times a okay so you see that if these two guys uh, were commutative quantities then i could just exchange a and b and cancel against this guy but typically a times b is not the same as b times a so i cannot cancel these guys and they have to be written like that okay and finally i have the product of b with itself so i'll get this term and this must be greater or equal than zero okay good so um then this is nothing but the expectation value of a squared and this is the expectation value of this operator that enters here every time you see a combination of operators of the type a b minus b a you call this the commutator of these two operators so a times b minus b times a is what we call the commutator of a and b and we denote that by these brackets so i write bracket a comma b bracket this means a times b minus b times a this is the commutator this is very important in quantum mechanics it is defined here what i mean by a commutator and finally the third term will be just the um, uh, expectation value of b square in the state u so it's hello. written here yes hello yes uh, please um i don't get the commutator part the a and b are not commutative so how come the difference them uh, the difference make them commutators I don't no, so really I, I didn't it. I didn't say that I what I'm saying is that this quantity a b minus b a is something that is non-zero right yeah and I I call that the commutator of a and b the commutator is a quantity that measures if two operators commute or not so if the commutator of two operators is zero then they commute if the commutator is non-zero, then they don't commute. Okay. Okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And there is something in the chat. Let me see. Uh, what is the role of Hermitian operator and why we need to have real eigencat? Um, so I, I didn't say you need to have real eigencat. Okay. Um, you can have uh, a Hermitian operator ensures that you have real eigenvalues that's 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 what happens but the the cat the eigenstate it can be a vector with complex entries okay this can happen uh, also why is necessary to make eigenvectors orthogonal okay so let me give a brief summary of all of your questions so why we need a remission operator so yesterday we discussed that if you want to compute uh, expectation values and you want that to be a real number, then um, um, your operator that you're taking the expectation value, if it is Hermitian, then you get a, a, a real valued expectation, val expectation value. Okay? So Hermitian operators, they are nice because they give uh, a real expectation values moreover hermitian operators have uh, real eigenvalues and what we have seen yesterday is that in quantum mechanics the outcomes of 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 a measurement they are uh, the eigenvalues of an observable so if you define an observable as a hermitian operator then you ensure that the possible values that you're going to measure, they are real, okay? Um, that's why uh, Hermitian operators play an important role. 
And then you say, also, why is it necessary to make eigenvectors orthogonal? Well, um, for Hermitian operators, this is also a nice property that comes out, which is if you have eigenvectors with different eigenvalues, then they are necessarily orthogonal. That's, that's a theorem. Um, however, this is... We, we like to have orthogonal eigenvectors for the same reason that we like to have orthogonal uh, vectors in linear algebra. Uh, if you have orthogonal vectors, then you can construct a basis. And if the basis is formed by orthogonal uh, uh, vectors, then your calculations uh, become uh, much, much easier when you, when you want to project this vector in some direction. So it's just a technicality, but the, the, the important part is to have a basis because you want to expand your states and your operators on this basis, okay? Does this answer all the questions? Okay, very good. You're welcome. Um, okay, so I just started with this very simple uh, uh, fact and I started, you know, playing with the algebra and I got this inequality here. And this inequality is saying this quantity must be greater or equal than zero. Okay. And the new thing that I introduced here that you should uh, keep in mind is the commutator of two operators. Now, moving to the next slide. Um, Moving to the next slide, I just also prove uh, something that is very useful, which is uh, the commutator of two operators A and B, where A and B are Hermitian operators, is also an operator. So if you take two operators, compute their commutator, then you get a new operator. And therefore, I can ask, uh, what is the Hermitian conjugate of this new operator, okay? So I'm just taking the dagger of the commutator. So you know that the commutator of A and B is AB minus BA. And if I want to take the dagger of this, I will have to take the dagger of this quantity, AB minus BA. This is what we have to compute. And then when I enter with the dagger, I'll have the dagger of AB minus the dagger of BA. But we have seen that uh, if you want to take the dagger of a product of matrices, then you have to invert the order of the matrices. So if you have A, B, then you write B, A, and then take the dagger of each matrix. So the dagger of this product is this product, B dagger, A dagger. And the dagger of B, A is just A, B with the dagger in each matrix. So it will be A dagger, B dagger. And this minus sign comes from the commutator. Okay? So here, from this side to this side, I just apply the dagger to this operator, okay? Now comes the fact that A and B are Hermitian operators. So if they are Hermitian operators, B dagger is just B and A dagger is just A. So I can just remove the daggers all the way here and rewrite this as B A minus A B, okay? But look, this is nothing but this, this term here. This is nothing but the commutator of B, A, right? It appears B, A minus A, B. So first comes B and then comes A, so B, A. But the commutator of B and A is nothing but minus the commutator of AB, right? 
So if I put a minus sign here, uh, if I, I put a pull out a minus sign here, this will be AB minus BA. And this is the commutator of A and B. Therefore, we conclude that the Hermitian conjugate of a commutator of two Hermitian matrix matrices is minus the commutator between these two matrices. So the commutator, the, the Hermitian conjugate of a commutator of two Hermitian matrices is minus the commutator. And therefore, when you take, when you have a matrix M and you take the dagger of M and you obtain minus M, we say that this matrix is anti-Hermitian, okay? So the commutator of two Hermitian matrices is a anti-Hermitian operator. Okay? Okay. Um, this means that when I act with a commutator on a cat, and I want to take the bra associated with this cat, I have to transform U to a bra, and this operator have to take the dagger. But the dagger of this operator, as we just have seen, is minus the commutator of A and B. So the bra associated with this cat is minus bra commutator of A and B. Okay? So with this fact, with this property, you can show that, uh, sorry, here there is a problem with my notation. You can show that I times the, I'm not going to, you can just read this line uh, after the class, you can work this out by yourselves. You can prove that the number I times the expectation value of a commutator is a real number, okay? This can be proved. So, this number that appears, I times this expectation value of the commutator is a real number, okay? So, this is a real number, this is a real number, Lambda is a real number, so lambda square is a real number, and lambda here is also a real number. So this is an equation that um, um, I have lambda as a free parameter, which is real, and this equation, this, sorry, this is not an equation, this inequality must be satisfied uh, for different choices of lambda, okay? So this is a quadratic uh, uh, inequality that I can solve just by computing the discriminant of, of this equation. So this is an equation of the type A lambda square plus B lambda plus C equals, sorry, greater or equal than zero. So if I want to compute the discriminant of this equation, then the discriminant is denoted by delta and this is B squared minus 4ac, right? So I can compute this guy. And when I compute this guy, I can only have uh, that the solution of this equation, of this inequality, sorry, is such that you, I can have just one solution, which is uh, equal to zero, but I cannot have two zeros for this inequality. So, the only way to ensure that if is, it is by demanding that my discriminant is, is smaller or equal than zero, okay? So this is, this is when you are working with uh, quadratic equations and, you, and someone asks you, how many solutions does this equation have? And then you compute the discriminant and see if it is positive, then you have two different roots if it is uh, zero, then you have two uh, uh, roots that are the same. And if the discriminant is uh, less or equal than zero, sorry, if the discriminant is less than zero, then you have just complex solutions. So I'm saying here that um, for this to be satisfied, the discriminant must be less or equal than zero. 
And if you work this out, you are going to get, uh, let me just clean a little bit. You are going to get uh, this inequality here, okay? So this inequality must be satisfied. For this inequality to be satisfied, as I said, you can um, um, you can play around with this um, with this inequality, and you know just by recognizing that um, the expectation value of a commutator is a purely imaginary number, you can rewrite uh, this inequality, and then you can show. As I said, I mean, this is written in details here. You can show that minus the square of this expectation value must be equal, uh, greater or equal than zero. And just by working out these algebraic manipulations here, you get to this conclusion. All right? So the conclusion is the following. The absolute value is squared of the commutator of two operators times one over four must be is smaller or equal than the product of these two expectation values here. So this is this is a non-trivial thing, okay? Because what you I mean you're 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 making a statement about uh, how much uh, uh, is the the value of this quantity given that I know these expectation values? So you know that if you if you have the expectation value of a squared and b squared in a given state u, and you multiply these numbers, these will be always greater or equal than one fourth of this quantity here. Okay, so this is a consistency condition that you you have to have. So you see that when I was explaining this, uh, this uh, inequality, I didn't assume any specific form of the state U. And also I didn't say anything about the operators A and B, apart from the fact that they are Hermitian. So this is true for all Hermitian operators and for all states U, okay? Good. Uh, so I don't want to lose the focus here with uh, algebraic manipulations, but rather I want to explain to you what this means, okay? Um, again, there is a bunch of uh, algebraic manipulations that is, I, I explicitly wrote them um, in detail so that you can follow what, what is going on. But now let's assume that I take two observables, x and y. If they are observables, we know that they are Hermitian. And now I will define the operators that I used in the previous slides, a and b, to be the following operators. a will be the operator x minus the expectation value of x in a given state u. So this is an operator if I multiply by the identity. So this is an operator that is just the identity times a number. And the same here for B. I write it as Y hat minus the expectation value of Y hat in a state U. Okay. So you see that in these inequalities, I have A squared expectation value in the state U and B squared expectation value in the state U. So I can compute what is the form of this expectation value of A squared in the state U if I demand that this operator has this form, okay? Well, you can work out these, these manipulations. It's not difficult. And you conclude that the expectation value of A squared is nothing but the mean squared deviation of the observable x, okay, in the state u. So I'm just saying that if a has this form, 
then this expectation value is just this deviation. Also, you can compute the commutator of A and B if the operators are defined as such. And if you compute the commutator, so you see you're going to have a bunch of products and then you're going to have a bunch of simplifications that they are identified with terms that cancel it, each other with the same colors, okay? So you can just follow the, the algebra here and you see that the, the commutator between A and B, where A and B have this form here, the commutator of A and B is just the commutator of X and Y, okay? So if I have these operators defining this way and I compute the commutator of A and B, this is the same operator as computing the commutator of X and Y. So this is just something that you can easily show. Now that I have chosen a specific form of the operators A and B by these equations here, I can just plug the results in this inequality here, okay? So when I plug the results in this inequality, I get this uh, uh, result. I get that the, uh, so we have defined this quantity delta A squared as the mean squared deviation, and then we define the deviation of being, um, um, well, you can call that also uh, uncertainty, right? So as this is square root, and what I'm saying is that the uncertainty for the observable X in the state U times the uncertainty of the observable Y in the state U is greater or equal than one over two times this um, commutator, okay? So what this inequality tells to you? First of all, this is what we call as the uncertainty relations in quantum mechanics. And you, you probably have heard that in quantum mechanics, if you know the position of the particle, you don't know its velocity. And if you know its velocity, you don't know its position. I mean, this statement is just uh, too vague, but what people want to say about that is what comes from this uh, uh, inequality here. So this inequality says that if two operators do not commute, so if the commutator is non-zero, then the uncertainty that you have for each operator, they must satisfy this bound. They must be such that the product is greater or equal than this commutator divided by two. Okay? Well, the expectation value of this commutator. So, uh, you can imagine by this statement that uh, people make that if you want to uh, define the position operator and the momentum operator for a particle, they will not commute. Namely, if you know, if you um, improve the uncertainty on the position, so if you make the uncertainty in the, in the position more and more precise, so you make it smaller, then, in order to satisfy this inequality, the uncertainty, uncertainty in the momentum must increase so that this inequality is satisfied. So, it is not that, it's not what, I mean, this is statement that if you know the velocity, you don't know the momentum and so on. This is not exactly true. I mean, what, what you say is the following. If you know very well the position, it means that the uncertainty in the position is very small. So if I'm decreasing this number delta x and this inequality must hold, then I have to increase delta y. So if I make my uncertainty about the position of the particle uh, is smaller, then I will increase my uncertainty about the momentum of the particle. That's what this inequality is about, okay? And this is, uh, uh, I mean, 
a striking result because this is very different from classical physics. I mean, this is telling you that there is a fundamental uncertainty when you measure uh, uh, quantum observables. And you cannot do anything about that. Okay? If you, uh, if you have a great certainty about uh, the position of a particle, then you are going to have a great uncertainty about the momentum of the particle. Okay? This is what this relation is about. Okay, good. And you see that this is completely associated with the, the, the commutator of X and Y. Right? And there is a comment. Yeah, so Abdallah is saying, we also encountered this when we discussed the double slit experiment. Exactly. So when, when we, we, we were discussing the double slit experiment, I mean, you remember that when you try to determine with high precision what was the position of, of, of the particle, then you completely affected the system in such a way that the, you destroy the interference pattern, right? So this is a consequence of all this. But most importantly, I mean, there is no way of having an equipment that will give you, this is not a limitation of your equipment, what I'm, what I'm describing here. This is a, a limitation of, of nature. I mean, so these uncertainty relations, they, they are valid. Uh, just because quantum mechanics has this non-commutative nature, all right? So, because two operators will not commute in general, then you have this limitation. As simple as that. Uh, there is another question. Why we are interested in momentum and position? On no, no, I mean, I'm, I'm just taking... Uh, a concrete example for this inequality, but this inequality is valid for any observables. So you can have, for instance, uh, uh, um, um, I mean, the Hamilton, sorry, uh, the energy and angular momentum. I mean, you can have all sorts of, of different observables, okay? And just compute the commutator between these, these, these observables and see if, I mean, if they, they do not commute, then you have a bound for the uncertainties that you can measure. Okay. Okay, very good. So, um, this brings to a very important concept, which is the concept of incompatible measurements. Uh, so, I, I, I started already to explain that, uh, but what I'm saying is the following. Um, if you make a measurement, of a quantity, um, and if this quantity, if the so, let me start again. If you have a quantum state, and you want to measure an observable, if this quantum state is an eigenstate of this operator, then you know that you are going to get always the same outcome. And this outcome will be the corresponding eigenvalue of this operator. Okay? So let's assume that you have a quantum state that I'm calling um, um, Ej, and you want to measure an observable that is x hat. Well, if this Ej is an eigenstate of x hat, then you know that this must be satisfied, namely, x acting on ej will give you a number times the eigenstate. So this is the, the quantity that you're going to measure. And uh, this ej is just an eigenstate of this operator, okay? But also, if you, are, if you have a general quantum state, right? So if you have a quantum state that is not uh, an eigenstate of the operator. But then you measure this quantum state. You measure, sorry, you measure this observable x. 
and you see the outcome as being x j okay so after the measurement after you perform the measurement you automatically projected your quantum state to the eigenstate ej okay so before the measurement the quantum state was unknown after the measurement the quantum state will be ej this is the collapse of the quantum state but pay attention to that um, there is a difference between starting in an eigenstate and then making the measurement and starting with a generic state and making the measurement in the first case i can repeat the experiment several times and i will always get um, the the result as xj in the other case where you have a generic state if I perform the experiment several times, I will get different numbers with different probabilities. But after the measurement, after you, you perform the measurement, the state of the system will be the eigenstate of uh, uh, the observable that you, you measured. So just think about polarization of light. It's always a very useful example. If you have light that is not i mean it's in a generic state of polarization i mean it's not even polarized okay so you pass this light ray through a linear polarizer after light pass through the linear polarizer you know that this uh, light ray will be polarized in a given direction namely you started with a generic state for your photon and after the polarizer your photon will be in a state of polarization theta for instance okay so um this is this is a very important concept which is after the measurement your system will collapse to the eigenstate of the operator that you measured so it means that after measuring x, if I get xj and I take this state and try to measure again, I will get xj again, okay? Because you collapse the system. Okay, but let's assume that I have another observable y such that this state ej Oh, my camera is uh, is dying. Well, I will not be able to fix that at the moment. In any case, um, if you have another observable y that um, e j is an eigenstate of this operator as well, then I can write that y hat acting on e j will be the number yj times ej so this is a number this is the eigenvalue so you see that ej is an eigenstate of two different observables okay this is just um i mean this is just uh, uh, an assumption that i made i i have another observable which has the same eigenstates as x hat so let's see what happens if i compute the commutator of x hat and y hat what is going to happen is that the commutator of x y will be x hat y hat minus y hat x hat acting on the state e j but look when y hat acts on ej this gives me yj ej and then i have to act with x hat on this new state and this will give to me xj yj times the state right because this is also an eigenstate of x hat 
Similarly, I can act with y hat and x hat on the, on the eigenstate ej. When I act with x hat on ej, I will get xj. And when I act with y hat on this state, I will get yj. So in the end, I have xj minus yj, sorry, xj times yj minus yj xj. But these are just numbers. So they commute. So when I compute that, this is just zero. So if two operators, two observables, have the same eigenstates, then what I'm seeing is that they have to commute. OK? This is just uh, um, a simple algebraic result that you can derive from this line to this line. Um, so if for a given eigenstate, uh, so for, sorry, if for a given eigenvalue, I have a unique eigenstate, then we have seen before that these eigenstates will be orth or orthonormal, right? So I can expand any vector in the basis of these eigenstates. So given a vector v, I can write it as a linear combination of these eigenstates. Okay. Then, yes. Hello. Hi. Yes, please. Uh, the f the first relation we have uh, e j is the eigenstate for x hat and y hat. Uh, can this idea work for the uh, electron Young uh, double slit experiment? Sorry, I didn't get the, 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 the end of uh, the question. Ca can we say uh, the same idea is correct for a uh, double slit experiment in case of electron? I mean, uh, at the beginning, we don't know which state electron has. He has to, uh, it can behave as a wave and as a particle. Yes. Uh, after we make measurement, we just uh, see it behave like particle. Yes. Can we apply this idea there? Uh, you have to be careful because what I'm saying here is just about the outcome of a measurement. Um, there, um, um, uh, the problem is that um, when you make a measurement, you a measurement to determine the position of the photon but oh, sorry the electron you necessarily affect the state of the of the electron so here i'm just saying that if you make a measurement of for an observable x uh, and this state is in an eigenstate of x then it will be, I mean, it will remain in this state, EJ. But what I'm saying is that I have another observable which the same property, right? So, um, also for for I mean, when you want to describe the state for the electron in the double slit, I mean, describing um, um, electrons is a bit more subtle than that. So uh, I, I don't want to carry on with the analogy too, too, too far away. OK. OK. Um, so what we have seen is that if this holds, then these op operators must commute. Um, but now if I expand a general state in the basis of eigenstates and I act with the commutator, well, the commutator of this operator is just zero, okay, as, as we have seen. So acting on this generic state will give zero as well. Um, so, uh, so what I'm saying here is that Operators that share the same eigenstates, they must commute. In other words, 
if you measure uh, an observable and you get well-defined results, namely you get always the same outcome, it is because the system is an eigenstate of this observable. And then if you have a second observable that also has this property, then these operators that represent these observables, they must commute. But you can, um, you can make the converse statement, which is if you have two operators that commute and EJ is the set of eigenstates of, of X, then you can show the proof is here. It's, it's as you can see, is a simple proof. You can show that these eigenstates must also be eigenstates of Y. So here we have sh shown the following. We have shown that if um, two operators have the same eigenstates, then they must commute. Here I'm showing that if they commute, then they must have uh, the same eigenstates. So what is the conclusion of that? The conclusion is that two observables will be compatible, namely, they are going to give well-defined results uh, if the system is in an eigenstate of them, if they commute, and is if and only if, okay? Because I have proved the two ways of, of, uh, of this statement. So we say that observables that commute are compatible observables. If observables do not commute, you cannot have the same set of eigenstates, all right? So, um, and this has, of course, implications for the, for the, for the un uncertainty relations that we just saw, because if the operators commute, then you don't have uh, a bound on the uncertainties of each uh, observable, but if they don't, then you have a bound. Um, and here there is a little exercise that you can do I mean, when you were uh, feeling like, um, which is to show that these operators associated with polarization of a photon, p hat pi over four and p hat pi over two, they are not compatible. So if you make these two measurements, you are not going to have the same eigenstates. So these operators, they do not commute. And you can show that explicitly by, by multiplying these operators, okay? Good, so I will stop now for the break and I'm going to speak about position and momentum operators in the next, uh, in the next uh, slot. And this is very important because uh, uh, when you want to describe a particle, uh, we describe a classical particle by knowing its position and its momentum. And we are going to learn how to treat those concepts in quantum mechanics uh, after the 10 minutes break. Okay, so thank you for your attention. See you in 10 minutes.